Thank you, Pastor Josh. Good morning. Wow, he kind of set the bar high there. I hope I don't disappoint. What a wonderful time of worship. I believe it's prophetic, as most worship is. Because what I want to share with you this morning uh, is what we just sang about. And think about it until we were in worship. But how many of you truly believe that God takes what the enemy intends for evil and he turns it for good? It's really not a setup question yet, but I want you to keep that in mind. Because I believe that there is an enemy of our soul, and there is an enemy of the church, and his name is Satan. His name is not your spouse's name, or your kids, or your neighbors, or your co workers, or your classmates. His name is Satan, and he is an adversary against all of humanity. And yet the church has been empowered by the presence of, of God, and the power of the cross. I love what Pastor Josh said. We fight from the position of the victory of the cross, and we have been empowered to overcome evil. And so much of what is happening right now, the, what many of us have been feeling as believers, is that we're being overcome by evil. But yet God has equipped us to be the overcomers of the evil. That what the devil intends to use against your life and mine and us corporately, God can use it for so much good. If, there's an if, if we're willing to submit, surrender, and align ourselves to his will. That, my friends, <laughs> is the hard part. God's already done his part. What he's looking for are participants around the globe who are willing to join in his mission, in his victory. The last two weeks, I've really enjoyed the messages. Lacey Wilbur, he preached a powerful message. I, amen? <clears throat> One of the verses that he used was from Acts chapter 5, verse 17 through 20 says this, the high priest and his officials who were the Sadducees were filled with jealousy and they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Then he told them, go, everybody say go, go to the temple and give, everybody say give the people, the message of life. The message of life. I thought what a powerful image of what needs to be happening right now, especially for the church in America, is we need to be loosened to go and give a message of life. We need to be set free so that we can tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ so they too can live in liberty. Amen? Amen? a powerful message. Pastor Josh last week preached about America, the land of dry bones. Were you inspired? Yeah. Amen. You might have been troubled in your spirit as well because he said this, and I quote, America is only as strong as the churches are in this nation. That's what your pastor told you. He went on to say that only 96% of Generation Z 
has a Christian worldview. Only, uh, excuse me, only 4% have a biblical worldview. He went on to say that only 6% of the millennial generation has a biblical worldview. That should trouble you in your spirit. I'm going to give you more bad news. And then I'm going to build you up. Because that's what the scripture does, right? My definition of faith is this. Faith is not the absence of reality, but our ability to trust God in the midst of it. Faith is not a denial of reality. Faith is being able to trust God in the midst of what is. And even in the midst of what we can't even see. What do we see across this land? There's a Gallup poll that just was published on March 29th this year. The title of it, U.S. Church Membership Falls Below Majority for the First Time. The article goes on to say, Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year in 2020, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's eight-decade trend. This is the first time this has ever happened in 80 years. In 2020, 47% of Americans said they belonged to a church. Only 47%. Down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. U.S. church membership was 73% when Gallup first measured it in 1937. And it remained near 70% for the next six decades. So for 60 years, church membership in America was 70% and above. Seven out of ten people in America were connected to a local body of Christ. goes on to say that this trend began a steady decline around the turn of the 21st century. The decline in church membership is primarily a function of the increasing number of Americans who express no religious preference. Over the past two decades, it says, the percentage of Americans who do not identify with any religion has grown from 8% in 1998 to 2000 to 13% in 2008 to 2010 to 21% over the past three years. Are you seeing the trend? The U.S. remains a religious nation with more than 7 in 10 affiliating with some type of organized religion. Now, what that means is, is that about 70% of the people in America still believe that there is a God. They just don't worship Him. They have no connection. They have no fellowship with God. They have no church connection. They're totally disconnected. Does that concern you? In a recent seminar that I attended, Daniel Yang gave these statistics using the U.S. Bureau of Census and also Lifeway Research. In 2010, there were 314,000 churches in America serving a population at that time of 309 million people in the U.S. That is approximately one church for every thousand people in the U.S. For us to keep up that pace, 
of one church in, uh, for every thousand people with population growth into the year 2050. So let's project into year 2050. We need 400,000 churches by 2050 to serve a population growth that is estimated to be around 400 million in the U.S. However, between 2010 and 2050, so if you take the first statistic from 2010 and now project to 2050, we need to at least net 86,000 churches on an average netting 2,100 churches per year. Netting 2,100 churches a year to keep up with the population growth. How do you think we're doing? It's going to get better. I'm painting a reality for you. Because what the devil intends for evil, God will turn it for good. Keep that in mind. Don't lose that hope. The not so good news is this. As of 2014, we were planning about 4,000 churches a year and closing 3,700 churches a year. Only netting 300 churches in a single year in America. 2,100 churches we need to plant to keep up with the population growth to serve and to reach this nation. And we're only netting 300. Do you see the challenge? Do you see the problem? Not to mention that people are disconnecting every day from churches. Not to mention, this statistic does not even take into consideration what Pastor John said earlier, that there is an estimate that that 40% of the churches that closed during COVID in 2020 and still aren't open may not reopen. That doesn't even take that into consideration. Friend, we have a challenge in front of us. Do you see what the devil is trying to do? So what's the answer? Every congregation in America must become right now a launching pad for innovative, strategic, and intentional church planting. We've got to plant more. Woo, that was so overwhelming, the enthusiasm. and uh, Got a little shaky up here. I understand. I understand. The problem seems so overwhelming. You can start to feel hopeless in this. As one who now has a full-time responsibility to travel and see what's happening in the church world, not only within our own network, but even around the world, it can be somewhat disheartening to come back to America, especially when traveling into places like Africa, where the church is the most explosive, even in parts of Asia, particularly in China, where the church is being just horrifically persecuted right now. Christians are being taken into... uh, internment camps and labor camps and being tortured and some of the stories that are coming out of those internment camps is just unreal, unfathomable. The same thing happening right now, the the massacre that is taking place in, in Nigeria where we have a network of churches in that nation and right now the, the persecution at just this week, Coptic Christians in Egypt We're slaughtered. It's just unbelievable what's happening. But do you know wherever that persecution is taking place, the church is growing exponentially. The church is literally exploding. 
because they have something to fight for. I'm not sure where that leads us here in America, but I don't believe that we can wait for that kind of persecution and violence to hit our shores before we get busy with the work of the kingdom. With the work of the kingdom. Amen? What this means is that we must be raising up and launching church planners and church planning teams on a regular basis. We cannot afford to sit and soak while assuming that unsaved and unchurched people, disconnected people, will gladly find us when they're good and ready. We must go. We must go to them. Amen? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Matthew 9, 35. Maybe a familiar passage to many of you, and maybe some of you not so much. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. I was thinking about this scripture when we were singing that song. You know, the blind are going to see, the mourners are going to dance. Thank you, B, for running through the sanctuary, a demonstration of God's joy that, that he turns our mourning into dancing. He heals the blind. He, he raises up the sick. I've, I've been somewhat amazed at times that, we, in the middle of a pandemic, I wonder how much the church has laid hands on one another and prayed for healing. Uh, it's just a question. When our culture has taught us to isolate from each other, and yet God has equipped us with faith in our heart to pray for the sick, to lay hands upon the sick that they may be healed. You see, that's overcoming evil with good. That's, and I'm, I'm concerned that, that the church in America, and, and I can say for our network, I pray that we would not succumb to this, but we become so accustomed to being isolated that we're going to stay isolated. We become so socially distanced, that we will just continually to be distanced. That is not, I cannot, there is not, there, there is no biblical basis for that. We, and I want you to hear me, that is not a political statement or a medical statement. That is just simply stating who we are as sons and daughters of the living God. He has created us for community. He has created us to walk through the towns and the villages as Jesus did, teaching in the synagogues, announcing the good news, and, and laying hands upon the diseased and the sick. That's what he did. That's what he modeled for us. And people are suffering and hurting. And they need the kingdom of God to arrive with good news. And Jesus says the kingdom of God lives in you. The kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom of God is in you and you and you and you. If you're a follower of Jesus, the kingdom of God is in you. You. You are filled with his kingdom. And so where you go, you take his kingdom with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Have you seen confusion and helplessness in the last 18 months? My opinion is, is that it was here before the pandemic. The pandemic just compounded. We've been 
hopeless and helpless for a long time as a nation, confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd, and we're kind of wandering around right now. We have people wandering around everywhere. And so Jesus saw this situation, and then he said, he said to his disciples, he turned to his little life group, and he said to his life group, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send to send more workers into his fields. Pray and send. Pray and send. (laughs) Hallelujah. Every life group leader in here, you should begin now, if you haven't already, to pray and to send. Because you've got to multiply. Some of you in that life group, you've got you've to be the one being willing to be sent. We've got to start more life groups all around this, this county and in this valley, amen? There are lost people. Did you not hear the statistics? That's the reality. You say, oh, but we're Christian here in the valley. You know that's not true. Think about your own family. How many people in your family are disconnected from God? From your neighborhood. How many in your neighborhood are disconnected? How many at at school or at work are disconnected from God? So pray for the Lord of the harvest. Now, the word here, it's important. I want to point something out. The word in Greek for to send forth in this verb, in, in this verse, is ekbola. Ekbola. Everybody say ekbola. You just said a Greek word. Here's what it means to eject, to bring forth, to cast out, to drive out, to expel, to leave, to thrust, to send away. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest and thrust people out of the church. Isn't that awesome? Put them them in an evangelistic cannon and just light the fuse and just blast them out of here. (laughs) That's literally what he's saying. It's not, hey, yeah. Maybe I'll go and for a little stroll with God. Thrust, man! You need, you need some rocket power up underneath of your soul. The only way that we're going to experience what Pastor Josh said is the dry bones coming alive is that the church begins to get ignited with the power of the Holy Spirit and being driven out. You've got to go, man. You've got to go. Got to go. (sighs) In other words, the church, is this church a landing strip or a launching pad for the kingdom? It's really both. But I like the fact that you think it's a launching pad. It's a landing strip because we all need a place to land and to experience God's love and community. It's a place where we need to land and be discipled and to be built up and to minister one to another, to be equipped for good work. Where we miss it sometimes is we forget that God is refueling us to be launched out. Every time you leave here, I often thought I'd heard about, you know, a church that had this um, you know, over their, their doorway to their sanctuaries, people went out. It said, you now enter the mission field. 
So when people came into worship and they were worshiping God and when they left the building, they were reminded you're being thrusted out into the mission field. There's a lot of people out there that are hurting, man. I'm thankful that this church has a long history of being a launching pad. We have been engaged in church planning in Richmond and Crozet and Nelson County and Farmville and the latest one in Weir's Cave. You know, there's a thriving church in Weir's Cave that was launched right out of this church. Amen? Who's next? We've launched mission teams, local and global. In Acts chapter 13, I want you to turn there. We're going to make a transition here to something. Because this morning, what I'm sharing with you is not just words floating in the air. But God is up to something. Amen? Acts chapter 13, verse 1 says, among the prophets and the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius, Manan, and Saul. In verse 2, it says, one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. I had to think this morning during that powerful worship time, that we were having, and the presence of God was here, and we were worshiping him, and we were praying. I don't know if any of us were fasting, but I wondered, who is the Holy Spirit speaking to in a way that he spoke to Saul and to Barnabas in Acts chapter 13 because they were at church just like you? And listen to what it says, and he says, the Holy Spirit said during that worship service at Antioch, Appoint Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent, sent them on their way. And so Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. As the church of Antioch again were gathered in worship, fasting and prayer, the Holy Spirit moved in power and called out Barnabas and Saul for a special work. In Acts chapter 1 to 7, the gospel, we read about the gospel filling the city of Jerusalem. In Acts chapters 8 to 12, the gospel moves to Judea and Samaria. And now in chapter 13, God is about to bust open the gates for the whole world to hear the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, the message of life. Hallelujah. Does that excite you? Do you believe that God still speaks to his church today about thrusting people out? part of this message this morning. I'm going to have Pastor Brad and Jennifer come up and tell you the rest of the story. It seems like a really good cue for the rest of the story. Paul Harvey, right? <laughs> Where do we begin? Um, the Holy Spirit has been stirring in us since probably June uh, 2020, uh, prob probably even before that. And this morning, I'm uh, excited to share with you a word that is coming to fruition from Pastor Josh, the word advancement, because Jennifer and I believe that we are being called to go into a season of church planning. <laughs> Friends, I can't tell you how important it is to be part of a life group because 
the story began in the life group in a barn right over here during COVID. Me and Scott May and Mike Brown and Pastor Dave, uh, may have been a couple other fellows were there, and I, I shared that our life group was coming to an end. Why? Because the Lord was beginning to stir something deep, and I didn't know what it was. I said, but the Lord is wanting me to go disciple. I took it as a singular. <laughs> um, I envisioned that it was going to be something to do with graceful beginnings, uh, being chaplain there and just being able to minister to the children. I knew that a, a new season was approaching where we would be adding the learning center. So I felt that's where the discipleship was to come in, but yet there was a continuing urge, a continuing call to do something deeper. We get to October and we go on our annual staff retreat in Tennessee. And if you've ever come back from Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, all the way to Virginia, you know that that trip is a little long. Um, it can be dull a little bit. And lo and behold, the Lord um, was speaking to my wife and to me at the same time. <laughs> we both were... Um, kind of processing in the car, and it had been a long period of silence, almost 45 minutes on the road, and we just kind of looked at each other and, and kind of like, what are you thinking? And she said, Brad, you're not going to believe this, but I, I feel that the Lord may be calling us to church plant. I believe that the Lord um, is wanting us to go out and do something else, a new church. And I had already been feeling that we were supposed to do a life group to begin church planting. Fast forward a little bit later, I remember telling Pastor Josh in one of our uh, individual meetings as we got back, just explained to him, I was like, man, I, I don't know what the Lord is stirring in us. I said, it could be mission work, it could be um, a new life group, it could be some type of discipleship, it could be church planning, I didn't know. And um, I just had knew, knew that the Lord was speaking, so that was really excited. The coincidence to everything, as you know, there's not many coincidences in the kingdom of God, is on that following Monday, when I had that meeting with Pastor Josh, there was a message sent out for Pastor Marty, who is head of our uh, pastor and training system. And he sent out a message indicating if anyone was interested in church planning, if you're feeling that call, I need you to reply to this message. He sent it to, he blanketed an email to all of the pastors in training. And I told Jennifer, I said, there is just no way, no way that this is in this. I said, but the message said, if you're interested, either reply back or contact Pastor Greg. So I said, well, tomorrow I'll call Pastor Greg and he'll shut this down really quick because the Lord is not going to use me to do that. Not with my past. Not with my struggles. Not with a blended family. And I remember calling Pastor Greg the next day, and he validated what we had been feeling. He affirmed it. From there, we began to very, very cautiously share with others to just begin that affirmation process. We talked to Pastor Glenn, which Pastor Greg recommended that we did. We talked to uh, Thomas and Jessica, our friends from Missouri, um, because they were feeling church planning as well. And so we, we talked to them and affirmed there. And one really key part that we wanted to be able to share with was our parents. We wanted to share with uh, our moms and dads, <laughs> but we didn't want to tell them, tell them. So uh, my folks, they watch online. They live all the way in Princeton, West Virginia. So uh, I remember we talked to uh, Jeanette Davis and Willie Davis first and just asked them to pray about maybe what the Lord is stirring in our life. We didn't give them any hints. Uh, we did the same to my parents in November. Mom and Willie were very quick to say, we feel that you're supposed to church plant. Very quick. Now my mom, on the other hand... Mom, I'm sorry, I have to share this. My mom thought we were going to foster children, <laughs> move to Bulgaria, 
uh, moved somewhere away from Virginia. But my father, yeah, my father, he's a little country guy. He said, Brad, I think you're supposed to go find another church. I said, Dad, what? He said, no, no, no. He said, go, like, start another church. My father spoke that over us and affirmed it, which was a big deal to us. Uh, yeah, it was huge. But we know, friends, when God calls us to these things, we know that he is also a provider. We knew that going out into this journey meant that we were going to have to be bivocational. We were going to have to be funded outside of the church because a church plant, it, it's more on the difficult side. And in January this year, I was um, afforded an opportunity that I didn't even know existed. And so uh, I was able to inquire of that job. The Lord is beginning to line up now to provide for our family for this transition to occur. So where we kind of leave everything is we are asking for your prayers. As we begin and have gone through this process of, um, of affirmation through our apostolic ministry, through our local elders, through our staff, through our life group leaders, we're asking you today to be in prayer for us as we will transition to a time of church planning. Initially, what that's going to look like is we were going to be vacating our leadership roles in order to fulfill that. We are afforded as a network to have mentors in this network that is going to help us through that process. One of them, of course, being Pastor Greg, Pastor Josh, and then Pastor uh, Glenn at Life Christian. He's the most recent to have went through a uh, church plant, so we're going to be um, probably making our way eventually there to further uh, that call. So we would ask that you just please join us as we hold on tight for what the Lord has prepared for us. So, my wife. Um, you did great. Thank you. Um, so, yes, um, like you said, um, we are vacating our positions, which is sad um, because we've been here. We've been here for over 10 years. We've been here for a while. And so it's, it's sad, but at the same time, where the Lord guides, he does provide, and he is, le he is raising people up um, for our positions. And so that's exciting. Um, I'm just with him. I stand right with him. And um, again, ask for your prayer as we go through this. The last piece I just want to share with you guys is the parable of the sower. That's what I feel the Lord is maybe even speaking to all of you today. Jesus spoke that over his flock. He spoke that to say, if you are setting on your gifts, it's time to get up and it's time to do something with it. The Lord was very insistent into telling us, good job, faithful servants. But we're kind of in the middle of the road of that parable. He's wanting us to do more than we have before. And I encourage you, God, the same Holy Spirit, our loving Father, lives inside of you. And it's time to move, friends. We got a hurting community. We have a hurting nation that needs more of the Holy Spirit. It needs more of Christ's love. Thank you. Pastor Greg. Stay right here. Come on up, Pastor. So I want to, uh, is that exciting? Um, so I'm going to have Pastor Josh um, take over the rest of our, our time here in a moment, but I want to bring you back to where I started. What the enemy intended for evil, God uses for good. Many of you who are sitting in this church remember several years ago, this couple stood right here on this floor 
after they stood on this stage and shared with you the brokenness that was in their lives. And they submitted themselves to us as a body to come around them and love them and care for them. And God restored not only their marriage, God not only restored incredible, precious places in their lives personally, but he raised them up into ministry and leadership again. And you have continued to champion them and come alongside of them and encourage them and be a part of their ministry teams, and they've had a tremendous impact upon this congregation. And I just get overwhelmed when I think about what could have been and now what is. Amen? That's what God does. That's what God does. And so this morning, after, uh, at the end here, we're going to gather around them again. And we're going to pray. <laughs> and we're going to just pray for God to have his way and for him to speak to us as a body. We want to hear your feedback and what you're discerning, and there will be a tool for you to, to do that. But I want to say, last week I heard Pastor Josh talk about it's time. He was talking about, you know, how the bones need to be connected that it's time for churches to be connected and partner together for kingdom work? Well, that's how we, that's our vision in our network. And that's why, do you remember that Pastor Glenn was a member of Cornerstone Church of Harrisonburg? He was on staff as the children's pastor at Cornerstone Church of Harrisonburg. He felt a call to plant a church in conversation with his pastor and our network leaders at the time, it was decided that Pastor Glenn would move from that church to this church and mentor under me because I had experience in church planning and could mentor him. And, and so we mentored him here. It became an incubator for him. And then we had people in this church who felt called to go and help plant that church. And those families are still there. And, and family members from the Harrisonburg Church also joined them. And so together as a network, we planted a church in, in Weir's Cave that now is going to embrace this couple who are leaving here, who are going to transition there, who are going to mentor under that church planter, and we'll all be a part of planting a new church somewhere in this valley. <laughs> Hallelujah! If that doesn't excite you, you need your pulse taken right now. That is exciting. Thank you, Tracy. That is how we work together. And so uh, there shouldn't be any competition in God's kingdom. Just partnership. Partnership and, and building. It. So thank you for listening this morning. And again, we, uh, we invite your feedback and uh, discernment as we move forward. Pastor.